Hello, everyone. This is Admiral Jamie Fogo from the Center for Maritime Strategy of the Navy League of the United States. And I'm coming to you today from Norfolk, Virginia. You're listening to Maritime Nation, a podcast designed to dive deeply into the policy challenges facing America's sea services and the role of the United States as a sea power on the global stage. We aim to provide you with the highest quality analysis on the most pressing maritime challenges by joining in conversation with key experts and practitioners. This is our eighth episode of the second season of Maritime Nation, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Admiral Daryl Cottle, Commander, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and Lieutenant General Brian Kavanaugh, Commander, Marine Forces Command. We are speaking in the midst of the ongoing large-scale exercise 2023. Now, a little bit about our guest today. Admiral Darrell Cottle, commissioned into the United States Navy after graduating from North Carolina State University with a degree in chemical engineering, and attended the Officers Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island. He holds multiple degrees, including advanced degrees from the Naval Postgraduate School, a Master of Science in Physics, a Master of Science in Engineering Management, and a Doctor of Management in Organizational Leadership. Wow. He assumed command of U.S. Fleet Forces Command, U.S. Naval Forces Northern Command, U.S. Naval Forces Strategic Command, and U.S. Strategic Command Joint Force Maritime Component Commander on December 7, 2021. Prior to this assignment, he was the Commander, Submarine Forces, Commander, Submarine Force Atlantic, Commander, Task Force 114, CTF-88, and CTF-46 and Commander of Allied Submarine Command, in addition to many other flag assignments. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Lieutenant General Brian Kavanaugh assumed his duties as Commander, uh, Commanding General, Fleet Marine Force Atlantic, Commander Marine Forces Command, and Commander Marine Forces Northern Command on August 30th, 2022. He earned his commission through the United States Naval Academy in 1990 and was designated as a Naval Aviator in 1992. As a general officer, he served as Deputy Commander, U.S. Marine Forces Pacific, Deputy Director for Operations, Joint Staff J3, off job, Assistant Deputy Commandant, Programs, Headquarters Marine Corps, Programs and Resources Department, and as Commanding General, First Marine Aircraft. General Kavanaugh's education includes a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the United States Naval Academy, a Master's in Business Administration from Webster University, and a Master of Science in National Resource Strategy from the National Defense University's Industrial College of the Armed Forces. He's also an MIT Seminar 21 Fellow. Great program, by the way. A personal anecdote. Admiral Carl and I have known each other for over 30 years. He's truly an accomplished submariner and an intellect. Daryl was the Submarine Group 8 Commander in Naples, Italy during my time as Commander 6th Fleet, and I valued the exceptional manner in which he managed our submarine force and those of our allies and partners. I'm proud of him for all of his achievements and delighted to have him on Maritime Nation today. Well, gentlemen, we'll get right to it with the first uh, battery of questions. On July 24th, 2023, U.S. Fleet Forces Command and these two gentlemen announced the upcoming large-scale exercise 2023 to be held in the month of August 2023. Now, large-scale exercise began in 2021 across the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Mediterranean Sea, under the auspices of Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday. LSC 23 will be the exercise's second iteration, where I'm delighted to serve as a senior role player for the exercise. And I've got to say it's incomparable to any other of the services, the other services exercise. It impressively brings together the Navy and the Marine Corps across, and get at this, six maritime components commands, seven numbered fleets, and 22 time zones. The exercise tests the maritime forces' abilities to command and control operations in the expansive, contested, and challenging environment of great power competition. The Navy and Marine Corps synchronize maritime actions and share resources between theaters in hopes that the adversaries will notice, and they will. The exercise also tests the maritime service's ability to synchronize operations. LSE 23 will integrate new technologies, refined distributed maritime operations, DMO, expeditionary advanced base operations for the Marine Corps, EABO, 
and literal operations in a contested environment, also known as Loki. This exercise highlights some important considerations. First of all, by capitalizing on the live virtual constructive acts, uh, aspect of this training, the Navy and Marine Corps are able to do a number of beneficial and innovative things. First, to reduce wear and tear on ships and equipment. Second, reduce wear and tear on people. And third, the services will significantly reduce the carbon footprint of the exercise due to the reduction in carbon fuel usage for the exercise. Now, lastly, and this is futuristic, but uh, hear me out. Doing part of this exercise live and part of it virtually, you can take a little bit more risk. We'll hear from our guests on that. It reminds me of one of my favorite books and movies, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. The main character, Ender, is a noted strategist and tactician, and he's told to lead a fleet in a simulated battle or war game. But in fact, it's no simulation. It's the real thing. Ender takes a lot of risk thinking that this is a simulation. He puts mission first and therefore takes some losses in order to destroy the adversary once and for all. When the dust settles, he's informed that this was the real thing and that by his actions, we've won the war. He's shocked. My point is that live virtual constructive is about as real as it gets, and it allows our sailors and Marines to take a little bit more risk and experiment with some of the concepts that we are testing in the battle laboratory. The bottom line is that LVC is the wave of the future, and the Navy is already planning for a follow-on exercise for LSC 2025. So let's deep dive into the scope and function of this expansive and elaborate exercise a bit more. Admiral Cottle, since America is a maritime nation, can you explain to our listeners first, how does large scale exercise 2023 contribute to a strong national defense and secure US waterways, both in CONUS and in international waters or the sea lines of communication that Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote about? And second, how is LSE 23 different than other large scale exercises like RIMPAC, Bold Alligator, or even Trident Junction? Over to you, sir. Hey, uh, Jamie, first of all, thank you, sir, for letting us take some time during LS23 here to take a break to uh, to talk with you about the importance of this global exercise with my great partner here, Brian Kavanaugh. Uh, you know better than most uh, the that the U.S. Maritime Forces, without question, provides the ensemble of the most flexible, mobile, and ready options for the National Command Authority. And if I could just take a moment to, to, for your audience to talk about the global environment and how we're operating today. We, we commenced about a little over a year ago a concept called One Atlantic. Um, and it's a, it's a partnership of how we are um, uh, providing forces to both the European Command Commander and the Northern Command Commander in the Atlantic in a fungible, seamless, and a sharing manner that makes our unified command plan line disappear in the middle of the Atlantic. That's been in run with just great progress in the last year or so. We just saw where we got to do this in what we're calling One Pacific. What's in the news in the last few days is the PRC and the Russian uh, Surface Action Group, you've seen all the Aleutian Island chain, up there testing that unified command plan line between the Indo-PACOM and the NORTHCOM. So you can see the maritime homeland is 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 under constant assault uh, by these adversarial uh, surface action groups, submarine forces, etc. We're also seeing this in the in the Arctic, and it's my goal to one day have a one Arctic too, as that grows in importance as as we know Russia is trying to militarize that area as the polar ice cap melts. So you can envision the need for this type of exercise, at least for nothing less than the Northcom commander could have operations going on in the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific, in which the homeland is, is being contested, in which he would have to coordinate with at least three or four Navy component commanders to actually go and handle that adversarial approach. When you couple that with what we've done with global extended deterrence options, where you've seen our ballistic missile submarines pop up in Central Command, European Command, all the Alaskan Aleutian, Busan, South Korea, Guam, Faslane, and the Southcom AOR, our maritime operations have never been more global. So we have to remain 
the, the nation's ability to project power globally for our country. And to command and control that effectively requires us to do these type of exercises. You mentioned the number of component commands, six, the number of fleet commanders, seven, 22 time zones. What you didn't mention is 13 graybeards, experts like yourself, that we have brought in to simulate and, uh, and role play for us and tension our decision making to make sure that these precious, low density, high demand assets like tanking, ordnance, to just name a few, that we know how to allocate those, those assets across these, these different areas of responsibility and we can refine the ability of how we do that. It's also important that we synchronize our maritime operations centers. That's not easy to do. You can't fight at the global level unless the way you have situation awareness on the threat is synchronized. And no one can do this better in the long run than the Navy Marine Corps team as we seek to maintain this long-term advantage over our competitors. Now, let me speak quickly to the second part of your question, which was about the difference that LSE has over RIMPAC, Bold Alligator, and Trident Juncture. And you mentioned it, it's really LBC on steroids. So we get a lot out of all those exercises. They're all vitally important. But what we're able to do at this global level is bring to bear the live virtual constructive technologies like you mentioned in Ender's Game analogy to where we're doing this like video gaming to be able to actually simulate high-end combat warfare across 22 time zones in a way that's just never been able to be done before. That allows us to have so many more players in the fight without disrupting our day-to-day -day force generation processes. It's, of course, cost-effective. It allows me to integrate in technologies, adversarial threat technologies that I just couldn't simulate with real forces, and it just reinforces the culture of learning in our Navy. I'll finish up this by just saying the Navy's learning continuum. LSC, and thank God that Sino Gilday has authorized this, and it's, you know, him, him greenlighting our ability to start this in 21 and again here in 23, is at the top of the food chain for our spectrum of learning. At the low end, we have experiments and type commander and, and community demonstrations, if you will. Then we have the, the FLEX series, which is run by the Navy, uh, the Naval Warfare Development Center. Then we, we obviously get a lot of doctrinal and, and capability testing during Comp2X and events where we do certifications. And then we have fleet battle problems and integrated battle problems where we bring these capabilities to bear. And then at the very top, we bring it all to bear in the large-scale exercise series. So hopefully that, that gives you a sense of why this is important and why we're spending so much energy doing this. Admiral, thank you. That's fantastic insights. And, and I can't resist commenting on uh, One Atlantic, the One Atlantic uh, uh, scenario, One Atlantic plan that you have articulated, that Admiral Dozier has articulated as something that we aspire to uh, when I was back in command in Naples, Italy, we never got there, and uh, you've gotten it into the uh, into the end zone, along with one Pacific, and I couldn't agree more on one Arctic across that transpolar bridge, which is fast becoming, you know, potentially the uh, the next showdown between us and the Russians and the Chinese, and they're up there and they're operating. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, seeing the uh, naval presence around the world and uh, things like SSBNs in Busan, uh, Korea, sends a very important signal to our adversaries and anybody that would want to challenge us. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to do this with the other Greybeards. You've got more fleet commanders over at NWDC than I've ever seen or could shake a stick at. And I got to tell you this, sir, uh, the energy in the room, you can feel it. It's electric and morale is super high. So everybody's really excited about this exercise. Uh, Follow-up question for you. What are some of the key challenges the exercise seeks to work through? And if you deep dive a little bit more, for you as uh, Commander Fleet Forces Command and, you know, writ large, the United States Navy, this is all about our ability to conduct distributed maritime operations worldwide. Why is that so important? Can you explain that to our listeners? Well, Jamie, as you know, and, and your listeners are probably very well informed, the distributed maritime operations, it's how the fleet fight. That is the underlying concept of operations that underwrites basically um, uh, our theory of victory of how we actually conduct large-scale uh, naval maritime force uh, operations. You know, since 9-11, uh, you know, our GWAT world, 
we live we lived pretty much uh, in a a uncontested environment where the seeds just really weren't contested, and uh, we were able to you know execute delivered ATOs in this post 9-11 low threat environment. And that's just not the environment we live in anymore. The times have changed. We're operating in a very, very threatened environment with peer competitors that basically have extraordinarily good uh, hardware that, that, that is on par with many of our own capabilities. So we have to be able to practice distributing our forces to make them survivable, be able to dynamically maneuver those forces with impunity from seabed to space, and that's challenging to do, and to integrate and synchronize those forces in real time in order to mass lethal effects at our timing and tempo. And so th while that uh, is an easy sentence for a fleet commander to, to say, what goes into actually pulling that off spans a lot of people doing a lot of things right. And you can't get that just like a, a great NFL team has to practice that timing and it's all about the timing of that handoff when that hole opens up. And uh, we have to get that timing right. And we got to be able to do it at the global scale. Fantastic answer. And I couldn't agree with you more on how we fight and uh, the ability to be able to choose uh, the point of that synergy at the place and time of our choosing. And uh, that keeps the adversaries, all of them, on their toes. Now turning to you, General Kavanaugh, let's hear more about the Marine Corps role in LSE 2023 and Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, which we call EABO, and which supports the projection of naval power by integrating with and supporting a larger naval campaign. It will be an important part of this exercise, and it's important for integrating the Marine Corps into maritime operations. LSE 23 will also test our force's ability to operate in a contested littoral environment. Now, in LSE 21, the Marine Corps tested the Autonomous Littoral Connector, a surface vessel designed to provide logistics from shore to ship in the littoral environment. This leads me to two questions. First, how is EABO different than traditional amphibious assault along the lines of what took place on Iwo Jima in World War II? And why does EABO matter in 21st century warfare? And second, can you please explain why it's important to seamlessly orchestrate logistics in such operations? Over to you, General. Hey, thank you, Admiral, and thank you for uh, hosting us here. I'd like to echo Admiral Cottle's uh, comments from earlier and just talk about you know, naval warfighting, because that's what we uh, do for our country. That's what we've done since our inception and the importance of the Navy Marine Corps team and the capabilities that it provides the nation. Uh, as he described, you know, there's threats out there that are, are different than when we joined. Uh, we joined, we were a threat-based force, uh, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we didn't have to be. The nation uh, needed different things uh, from its Marine Corps. And we were probably more aligned with the uh, Joint Force Land Component Commander in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but right around 2016, then Secretary Mattis and Chairman Dumford produced a national defense strategy, national military strategy that put us back as a uh, in a threat-based uh, force environment. And I think what you're seeing today is the uh, Marine Corps uh, in the integration in the Maritime Operations Center as well as in the exercises that we do, uh, the Navy Marine Corps team coming together, uh, just like we did since our founding in 1775, Navy Marine Corps team doing things for the nation, uh, keeping the sea lanes open, sea basing, and those types of operations. For your viewers that watch Marines at Iwo Jima uh, doing amphibious assaults, uh, that capability, the force, forcible entry capabilities are still things that we train to do and still a requirement. Uh, but expedition and advanced base operations should think of uh, smaller teams, uh, lower signatures with uh, kit, kit that they can either sustain or sense or provide fires with. And they're all in support of the fleet commander. So as that fleet commander develops a fleet campaign, the EABL is under the uh, DMO, Distributed Maritime Operations Umbrella, just like Loki 
with our operations in contested environment, it's kind of that uh, DMO umbrella, umbrella that we view as somewhat of maneuver warfare uh, for the fleet commander. Uh, the second part of your question about logistics, I would answer, you've, we've all heard the saying, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. It's about speed, it's about tempo, and that's about sustainment. So during LSE, we are executing a lot of logistics uh, operations and, and exercises to learn and stress, as Admiral Carl already talked about, uh, our ability to uh, sustain uh, the momentum that we get in uh, in a uh, naval campaign in war fighting. So there, there's many aspects that we've learned in uh, LSE 21 that we're going to continue that we learned in Fleet Battle Problem 23 that we're going to extend into LSE 23 uh, specifically to get after the logistics. General, thanks a lot for that answer. And, you know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, for the longest time, I mean, a period of 20 years after 9-11, uh, the Marine Corps dutifully had its boots in the sand in Iraq and in the mountains of Afghanistan. And I remember when uh, General Neller was on watch as your commandant, it was one of his missions to get the Fleet Marine Force back to sea. And I think uh, he succeeded. And, uh, you know, subsequently, uh, General Berger has kind of finished uh, that uh, execution of that plan. And Marines are back on our ships, and it's so important. So I'm really glad to see that. On uh, logistics, I would have to tell you, you know, one of my favorite expressions coming out of Trident Juncture was logistics is the sixth domain of warfare. A lot of people challenged me on that. And uh, they said, well, what do you base that on? And if you look at a NATO doctrinal definition, you know, a domain is supposed to be an enabler for the other domains of warfare. So when you think about land, sea, air, space, and cyber, logistics certainly enables all of those domains. And so I actually think we ought to bring it on as number six. And, uh, you know, while I'm on a roll, let's talk about the biosphere we live in, COVID, and uh, the adversary in that domain, and that's germs. Uh, lastly, I'll tell you, you know, running around Trident Juncture uh, in uh, Norway in the land of the Vikings, one of my favorite things uh, to talk about with the troops, and I was always with my J-4 at Fuel Farms, Farps, S-Pods, and A-Pods, was a quote from uh, Alexander the Great, and it went something like this. Should I ever lose a battle, my logisticians know that they will be the first that I slay. And that's how important it is to modern armies, the Marine Corps, and the Navy. Well, let me shift gears here. Uh, for both Admiral Cobble and General Kavanaugh, I'd like to get your thoughts on unmanned platforms and the role that they'll not only play in LSC 23, but in the future of warfighting for the Navy and Marine Corps. So we have uh, one of Admiral Caudill and my friends down at uh, uh, Fourth Fleet, uh, Admiral Jim Aiken. He was a Deseron commander in Naples when we were over there. He's a uh, Fourth Fleet commander now. Our listeners may not know this, but uh, during our recent uh, Navy League Sea Air Space Gathering at National Harbor in Washington, D.C., we had about 18,500 people there. Uh, both the SECNAV and the CNO uh, did a lunch uh, talk together, a working lunch, and they announced that Fourth Fleet would be the next theater for experimentation with unmanned systems. So Fifth Fleet first with uh, uh, the Joint Task Force, and now uh, Fourth Fleet, not a Joint Task Force, but Admiral Aiken has been given some poetic license to experiment under the auspices of Admiral Cottle and his comm commander. So Admiral Cottle, uh, for you, what does that mean to you and how does that figure into the conduct of LSC 23? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, um, before I answer that, I just wanted to, I want to foot stomp a thing uh, the, back to the previous question about how, what a great partner Brian Cavanaugh has been on really highlighting to the Marine Corps team here that we are one team with the Navy. He, he, he will not let me forget that ever. And, uh, and, and he speaks to that. It, even though people try to derail him from that message, uh, he sticks on it. And I know General Eric Smith is the same way. And so the guidance that uh, General Smith has put out really just puts that out in spades. They're great partners. And I would mention on the logistics piece, what came to mind, you know, if you want to see an example of how impactful logistics, logistics are, just look at the Russia challenges in Ukraine today. Roger and, that. Uh, and just if you just you see that in spades of, of the challenges poor logistics and supply chains have in high-end combat. 
Uh, the unmanned piece is extremely important. And uh, unmanned technologies are obviously a priority for the Navy and the Marine Corps. It's aligned to our national defense strategy, our national mi uh, military strategy. It helps us understand and prioritize investments in future capabilities. You know, the way I view, they are definitely enablers. Uh, they help me buy down risk to mission, risk to force in high threat environments where the acceptable level of risk, quite frankly, is too high to put manned uh, or uh, people-based uh, systems in there. And I think they're best when they're coupled with artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, systems where we tend to be data rich and analyst poor. So when you bring the unmanned together with the AI ML, you can really get some formidable capabilities. And I would also tell you that it's um, inextricably tied, Jamie, to the CNO's vision for the future Navy design. So he's put out in, in his own uh, discussion points about the breakdown of our Navy composition in the future, and unmanned plays a very big role in that. As far as LS23, uh, unmanned technologies will play a role. I won't go into all the ones that we're going to actually get after at this stage uh, of the exercise, but they will play a role. I want to talk about a little bit what they do, though, and what we get from testing them in LSE. Number one, they help us define and refine our concept of operations and our concept of employment. You know, everybody wants to come to the table and, and, and brief me on a new unmanned system. And the first thing I ask them is, how do I get it in the last tactical mile? You know, that's what you have to convince me, is that last tactical mile. It doesn't mean anything if I can demonstrate over here in the Southern California and operating areas or off the Bay Capes. I got to be able to put these things and operate them uh, in the, a very highly contested environment. So it helps us understand the C3, the command and control, and just as important, the communications with these systems and the requirements. And that's on a specific platform basis. And I would tell you that the strategic laydown and dispersal requirements for accessing, basing, and overflight of, of unmanned capabilities is important to get in conversations and discussions with our partners and allies. We're not going to be able to do that last tactical mile from the United States. So we've got to partner with, with different folks that are going to help us with this, these unmanned. And then lastly, I would tell you, for a, I'll let General Kavanaugh and you discuss maybe the Marine role in this, it lets us, it puts a point on the limb facts of these capabilities. There are some sustainment challenges with them and just, we, you know, we think they can do X and then in practice, we turn out they can do Y and practicing helps us determine those gaps and know what we need to do to shore some of those up going forward. And that, that's what I would tell you about unmanned, sir. Thanks, Admiral. And uh, let me uh, just comment uh, as far as the Marines are concerned, General Kevin. I've been really impressed with uh, what you've been doing, particularly out in the Pacific, and you were uh, coming from that arena on unmanned systems and experimentation. So you've really kind of taken the concept of a literal Marine regiment and tested it out. Uh, in particular, you know, I talked to Admiral Casey Moten about the use of the uh, medium uncrewed surface vessel. You guys have been using that in the island hopping campaign to reinforce Marines from coral reefs on islands, uh, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, which really complicates the targeting problem for the adversary. So kudos to you. But uh, over to you, sir, on uh, unmanned systems and future warfighting in the Marine Corps. Admiral, thank you again. And I, I agree with Admiral Cottle. So we have all these systems. Uh, there's an aspect of logistics and logistics sustainment uh, that we're testing. We have our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab through our CDNI concept development integration uh, led by uh, Generals Allison and Generals Heckel, respectively, that work closely with uh, Nautic the Naval Warfare Development Center in, in again, support of that naval campaign. So during LSC, we are testing a lot of undersea surface, air, and land uh, capabilities. A lot of it is logistic uh, related. Let's go back to your previous question about sustainment and the importance of sustaining the momentum uh, in that environment is, is critical. Critical is, you quoted Alexander the Great, that's a, a superb, uh, I'll say, uh, quote, and I'm going to steal that from you if you don't mind. But Absolutely. <laughs> the, um, you know, th there are a lot of uh, unmanned systems, and I, I agree with Adam McCardle, that we have to look at how we can integrate that with AI, how we can integrate that with uh, the hardware that we have, whether that be uh, 
you know, a future destroyer or a future aviation platform, or 6Gen or whatever, uh, just how we can uh, bring all these things together. And AI is going to be a big piece. If we can figure out the quantum, that's going to be a big aspect. But the main thing for me is that we're in an environment, live, virtual, constructive, that we can, uh, like you said earlier, uh, take more risk. And, you know, there's going to be failure, and that's a uh, good learning. Uh, it's an environment where uh, we can ensure that we uh, create as much learning as possible so that if we nation calls upon us, we can uh, go and win. Absolutely. You know, the nice thing about this, too, is uh, we do the exercise and so many lessons learned out of LSC 21, I would expect even more out of LSC 23. And then it's perfect timing because uh, there's enough time between now and the spring of 2024 to absorb that. And when it comes to testimony for, you know, Admiral Cottle or a new CNO on the Hill, you know, we've got our uh, laundry list of things that worked, uh, things where there's uh, gaps and seams or shortfalls that we want to fix and a set of resources that we need to get the job done. So it really is a, a, a very worthwhile effort and worth the effort and the time and the people that, uh, that you're putting into it. So thanks for that. My final question for both of you today uh, is the role of Fleet Cyber Command and defensive cyber operations in LSC 23. Frankly, uh, you know, this uh, warfare domain scares me, and I think uh, it should scare everybody uh, because the adversary is moving uh, fast and so are we, uh, particularly in offensive and defensive operations. So I'll start with Admiral Cotter. What can uh, you tell us about war fighting in a contested environment and how we're going to do that? Jamie, you know, cyber and space operations from the Navy's view are inextricably linked and integral to fleet operations or it's they enable. In fact, you know, we're just uh, was just in the process uh, a couple of days ago, taking the brief on uh, the Ike's Comp2X results and certifying them for deployment. And every time I do one of those Comp2X uh, certification briefs, the information warfare commanders prominence in that grows. And we're finding that person in that domain, if you will, at the center of the Venn diagram of everything that's important to the strike group commander on how they're making their decisions. Because at the end of the day, they control the emissions control posture and the tactical situation posture, the tax set, if you will. And so it's just so incredibly important. It's important to the defense of our command and control systems, battle space awareness, our decision-making superiority and decision aids. And you talked about some cyber effects, both offensive and, I think, defensive. Both are extremely important. They tend to be things that we do in these exercises that are largely classified, unfortunately, so it's hard for me to get into the details. But they are integral to LSE 2023 and that they further our understanding of fleet capabilities. And quite frankly, they're... They're vital to connecting our maritime operations centers together so that we can safely and securely and effectively command and control our forces. I would tell you our, our space and cyber component commander, um, 10th Fleet, he integrates, I'm Clapperton, he integrates every day with his joint force counterparts to support the fleet commanders for cyber defense, cyber security, cyber awareness, same for space, including space situational awareness. And he, he's vital to me personally in my Navstrat hat in that he defends and makes sure that the, the Navy's NC3, the nuclear command and control and communication systems are protected and are available for our strategic forces. So it's a great question and nothing could be more important and it's got our full attention during the LSE 23, sir. Thanks very much, Admiral. General, what about the Marine Corps? Admiral, I'll say from LSE 21 to today, we've uh, learned a lot. There's a uh, very little a play in LSC 21 from our perspective. Uh, since then, uh, Commandant Berger established the Marine Corps Information, excuse me, Marine Corps Intelligence Command, uh, which is a subordinate command to me. I've tasked that commander who's also dual hatted, triple hatted, and, you know, he's more for cyber and more for space. And what he is able to do is really synchronize efforts across all the more force, so Marine Corps specific and more for your F for LSE 23, uh, he's able to bring in those aspects. We'll have our cyber ops group and our second network battalion 
augmenting the Navy Cyber Defensive Operations Command, and they'll execute uh, their missions as a Navy Marine Corps team. Thanks very much. You know, as uh, you both were talking, uh, I go back to another book, uh, more recent, and that's by Peter Singer and Ghost Fleet. Now, Peter's helped us out at the Navy League with a number of different uh, activities. I think he's going to be at America's Future Fleet on December 5th. And uh, that's just an outstanding book. And everything that he says in there, he backs up with a study, uh, you know, in the reference section of the book. But I think the worst time for a Navy or a Marine Corps to experience a loss of comms would be in a real fight. And so we've got to train our people to be ready for that and figure out how to pick up and go uh, with alternative methods of connectivity or communications. And I think uh, with you two gentlemen at the helm, uh, there'll be a realization of that on the deck plate and uh, we'll move forward. And Jenny, well, I would just say, if I could on that, you know, please. everybody's got their instantiation of, you know, JADC2, Joint Assured Domain Command and Control, and the Navy's Project Overmatch and our Navy operational architecture is just a, just a tremendous vision on what you just described by making communications a service and making sure that the different modes and modalities of ways to communicate tactical units is very robust. Uh, to your exact point, that you do not want to lose comms in a high-end fight. Absolutely. And uh, gentlemen, uh, I want to leave you the last word, but first I'd like to say uh, what a pleasure and an honor it's been to be able to talk with you today. Uh, nobody is more convinced than me as uh, a retired flag that our Navy and Marine Corps are in great shape, uh, particularly with leaders like you at the helm. And uh, I spoke with Admiral Caudill here a month or so ago, two months ago, and uh, he gave me a rundown on the performance of uh, USS Gerald R. Ford before she went on her first long deployment. She's operating the Sixth Fleet Theater right now, and I'm uh, jealous that Admiral Ishii has got her for a whole deployment. At any rate, the performance of that carrier, evaluated by uh, Carrier Strike Group 4 on her Comp 2X, was really unmatched. The sortie generation rate for that carrier uh, is better than we've ever seen before because of the design, because of the 23 new technologies on that aircraft carrier, which people criticize the Navy for, but it was the right thing to do because now every subsequent ship of the Ford class is going to be better and better and better. And as they get out there and deploy, I think our adversaries uh, should take pause and say, as we always uh, want them to say, today is not the day because the Americans are better than we are. And we're proving that every day. So uh, before I go into a conclusion, let me leave you with the final word. Anything you'd like to uh, say to our audience? And we'll start with Admiral Caudill. Well, sir, thank you again for hosting us. What a wonderful opportunity to talk about this ongoing global exercise. I don't know if anyone else in the Joint Force, other than the Navy, would even attempt to pull something like this off. Uh, but the Navy has got to be able to be the global uh, player in the Joint Force. When the president needs options, he needs it immediately, and we're there. We've got to be able to have you know, good situational awareness across all these time zones and maritime operations centers. And I would just say on the forward point, you just you just highlight such a great point that you know people tend to forget the first of in a class and the, the trials and tribulations that they go through. You know, I can remember when we put Seawolf to sea as the first Seawolf class submarine with, you know, at that speed it was operating at, things flying off of it. Couldn't shoot the torpedoes at that speed. And, uh, you know, that's been quickly forgotten now as the perhaps the world's greatest submarine that's ever been built as we work through those things. And the learning curve on Ford, you know, with all those new technologies you mentioned, has been just eye-watering. And now bringing that to bear in the theater of operations, the Sixth Fleet, uh, it's just no turning back now. And uh, that's going to be a class of uh, aircraft carriers that's going to take us into the future and just, I think it's only going to get better. So thank you for acknowledging that. And thank you for hosting me today, sir. Absolutely, Admiral. General, over to you. Admiral, again, as Admiral Carter already said, thanks for hosting. And, you know, this live virtual constructive environment, uh, I'm a big fan of learning and learning uh, in an environment where you can make mistakes and iterate and get better and better and better. We've done that throughout our history. I'd say that there's no greater power on this earth than the Navy Marine Corps team that you have today. Uh, it's an exa example out there, the ARGMU is out in the Pacific, out in CENTCOM AO, as well as out in Europe today. 
kind of the crown jewel of you know the representation of uh, what the Navy, Navy and Marine Corps team can can do. Uh, it's much bigger than that when we talk about naval campaigning. You kind of reference the World War II and the island campaigns, but you know the fleet commanders that we have today and the um, uh, fleet marine force that you have today. There's nothing uh, comparable on the planet. And just you know, for your listeners, uh, trust you know, as Admiral Carl Carl already stated, you know, uh, the Navy Marine Corps team is in a good position, and we're only getting better and better. So for any potential adversaries out there, you might want to watch out. Absolutely. Thanks very much, General. And, you know, you talked about learning and uh, so did Admiral Cottle. And I got to tell you that uh, going into this exercise, I'm so impressed because uh, MAR-4 and fleet forces have no fear of failure. There is no fear of failure. You're willing to take risk. I see that uh, amongst the people on the deck plate over at NWDC and on the waterfront. And that takes guts and leadership, and it's inspired from the top down. So you two are doing a fantastic job. And folks, uh, for Maritime Nation, episode eight of 2023, that's a wrap. But before I conclude today, I want to introduce a new routine uh, where I went back to my plebe year at the United States Naval Academy and pulled out the Naval Terms Dictionary. And uh, I've given it to my staff so that they can unpack the significance of some of the, these terms. And we thought the term for today would be most appropriate, and that is fast cruise. This is what the dictionary says about fast cruise. Trials of several days in length and conducted while the ship is fast to appear or at anchor, with only the ship's crew on board. The purpose is to train personnel in all operations of the ship's equipment and check out its proper operation in as many ways as practicable. Considerable ingenuity is commonly exercised to simulate actual conditions at sea. Originally devised to check out the readiness of a nuclear ship and crew after completion of the construction period and prior to sea trials, it's now extended to include post-overhaul trials and non-nuclear ships as well. I'd like our listeners to think about that definition in the context of what you all are doing in Large Scale Exercise 2023. I'd like to thank our listeners for joining us each month. If you have not heard our previous episodes, you can always catch up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Episodes and all content described here can be found on our new website, www.centerformaritimestrategy.org, all lowercase. And thanks to our two sound engineers today, uh, James Peterson, assisted by Taya Dunleavy, the editor of the Mockback and Headquarters, for bringing us all together. Stay tuned for the next episode of Maritime Nation. Thanks.